probably would like to, to go back to last year where my uh, good friend and, and predecessor, Paul Murphy, he kind of used a, a, a baseball vernacular and said, you know, which was a tough time back a year ago, said we're in the second inning and it's going to be a double hitter. Now, I'm not really a baseball guy, but I asked Dave Stevenson, one of our executives and 16-year banker and college baseball player, I said, where do you think we are now? He says, uh, we're at the seventh inning stretch. Everybody needs to stretch, get some more beer and popcorn because it's going to be, a, it's going to be extra innings. The game's really tight. And uh, that probably best kind of sums up where we are. Is that right, Dave? Is that accurate? Something close to that. Really, I know we're about out of time, but there's really kind of three themes I want to want to cover. Um, one is really the, the to really understand what drives banks' behaviors. You got to understand the regulatory environment, especially today. I mean, just a, a serious regulatory oversight. The Financial Reform Act really was the price for government support, uh, and it is a hindrance to growth for for the banks. Uh, contrary to popular belief, there is a lot of money to lend, but there's less willing and qualified. Uh, takers. And uh, it is smart to be cautious. We're in an unusual time, but I think if you're overly pessimistic, that's very, very dangerous. And um, you start to see some of that. So you go back to uh, where David was talking about in the, the fall of 2008. Uh, any kind of objective and, and fairly serious student of that event who read the books like The Big Short and Too Big to Fail. Uh, the free markets, the capital markets, they failed to self-regulate themselves, which is a basic tenet of free enterprise. And government regulation didn't work either. So uh, government had to step in, you know, bailed out the financial system. And so part of the price of that has been really new reform, which just, just got passed. And I can go, I can speak for an hour about that, but if you have what we really are called the key implications of the Frank Dodd Financial Reform Act, it really is growth limitations on the largest banks. I think the government is very serious about not being in a position again where they have no choice but to bail out the banks. And the bigger you are, the less options you have. So actually there's a law passed that says no one bank can comprise more than 10% of the domestic liabilities of the U.S., which basically says the top four banks can't grow. Uh, also less leveraging in the industry. Banks are going to have to raise more capital. The largest banks have got away with less, less capital re, uh, requirements than smaller banks. They've got to kind of raise their, their capital requirements. They made a lot of money in, in uh, derivative trading securities. Uh, that's, that's been severely diminished. Um, they're also, I think, with the, the tough burden on the smaller banks is just over 100 new laws. So the, the regulatory compliance burden is going to be incredible. So a really a disadvantage for smaller banks, but again, you know, really, really no choice. The X Factor is a new consumer protection agency that's been created. They haven't named the head of that. So if you're really heavy into consumer finance, which most of the big banks are, uh, there's going to be a lot of, lot of change in that. You're already, already seeing that. The good news for depositors is uh, better FDIC insurance coverage. The government, to help the small banks, said all uh, non-interest bearing deposits for through the end of 2012 in all banks has unlimited coverage. Uh, so, so that's good news for depositors. Also the 250 increase has become, has become permanent. But you get away from the, uh, the Frank Dodd Act, which, is, which will be felt in, in the days ahead, the real impact on banks right now is really just the, uh, the, the, the national, uh, whether you're a national bank or state bank, it's really the, uh, the, uh, the scrutiny for really examining the bank's credit quality. That's gone on now for really over, over two years. And you know, one disease that all bankers suffer is denial. So when you get the OCC in your bank, they, it's a really a reality check. And so you, really the banks have been forced really over the last two years to basically increase their reserves and uh, rather you do that through operations or whether you do it through the capital markets and really a lot of, a lot of progress in, in that area. But the big banks really have, have, have really felt the, the biggest scrutiny because that's where the biggest, biggest impact is. So really all banks are, are in various stages of recovery from credit problems. If you, if you were out there lending the last five years, you, you're not you know, you know, uh, uh, problem free. But uh, I do think the good news is, I'll show you some charts, is the banks have built up meaningful loss reserves. You just don't really take a, you don't build a, a reserve when you have a problem. Uh, so I think when people say, well, the banks are kicking the can down the road, well, the reality of it is you're getting reappraisals every six months. You're having to prove to the regulatory that every loan you got on the books is a good loan. 
If you think it's a good loan, they don't think it's a good loan, you still got to set up a reserve, and I'll show you a chart of that in just a minute. Um, so you can get a copy of all this, but this really kind of talks about, one comment on this slide is, they've now determ determined who are the systemically important banks in the U.S. And so there's e even increased oversight on the systemically important banks. That's all banks over 50 billion in assets. Uh, our bank, we're part of the Zions Bank Corp. We're the last one on that list at 52 billion. So I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, um, but there, that's you know another layer of regulation, which again to really kind of protect from this event to occur again in the future. Uh, the Volcker rule about really less proprietary trading. I think we all applaud that. That's that's good news. Uh, the capital requirements are going to actually, this makes a lot of sense, where they're going to start forcing the banks in the good days to basically put aside more capital. You know, build your reserves in the good times. Don't wait till, the, till times are tough. This is really exciting about, you know, compensation restrictions on all banks. Real. <laughs> um, I, I mentioned about the FDIC insurance reform and then the, the, capital, the capital requirements. Uh, then the consumer protection, that really is going to be a, 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 a lot but good, for, good for the consumer borrower, for bad for banks. You know, the, for example, NSF fees. I remember sitting on our committee about setting NSF fees. Ten years ago, I think it was $8 for a hot check. And then you get all the big banks' averages and say, okay, we're going to come in at $2 under the big banks. It went from 8 to 32 That's over. It's going, to, it's going to drop. You saw where Wells Fargo was fined over $200 million. Why? Because the way they would decide how hot checks were processed was the biggest item to the smallest. So that would increase their income. So they got, they got spanked for that. As far as the, the, the banks kind of recognizing the problems and the increase in problems, this chart just really shows the, the really run up in non-current loans charge offs, but the, you know, like I said, the, the sliver of hope is at the very end, it's starting to, to tell off. So we've had two quarters now of really decreased problems. The, uh, the, how, the, how the industry has really covered their problem loans, that's the, uh, the red line. You saw that the banks had reserves going into this. They basically depleted all those reserves uh, while they were still building reserves and those have increased. Uh, 